Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Yukio Mishima's novel, The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea. And I want to start out by talking a little bit about Mishima himself, um, because his, his views, his philosophy tend to infuse his writing. Now, he's, he was one of post-war Japan's great writers. He was incredibly influential and I, I, I don't, I have a problem when it comes to Mishima because on the one hand I really like the things that I've read of his. He has a brilliant prose style and he's a great writer, but I find his politics incredibly problematic. He was a far right wing ultra nationalist. Um, he he expressed admiration for Hitler, and uh, he he actually died um, because he and a number of of right wing comrades attempted to launch a coup, um, and when it became clear that that was not going to work. He committed seppuku, which is a Japanese uh, traditional suicide carried out by samurai, and it, he actually was a descendant of samurai. He was of a he was of that class, um, and he had been raised and sort of imbued with the bushido code, which was a warrior's code in which death was preferable to dishonor. Um, so. As someone who is a left, uh, who is a leftist, whom Mishima would probably have not, have not agreed with politically, uh, and as someone who is half Jewish, uh, I'm I'm really uncomfortable with Mishima's politics. That being said, the sailor who fell from grace with the sea is a really interesting and disturbing novel. Um, some of the key concepts in here are sort of existential philosophy, um, almost a sort of Nietzschean belief in I mean, Nietzsche calls it the Ubermensch um, in German. The the superhuman. Um, there's this sort of longing for the superhuman. There's this faith in the superhuman, and incredibly problematic elements to try and sort of realize the dream of the superhuman. Um, so basically, this is. A novel about three main characters. Uh, there's Ryuji Tsuk uh, Tsukazaki, uh, who is the sailor. Um, Ryuji comes into the novel as this sort of alienated figure who has rejected the land, who has who has severed his ties with the terrestrial world and has imbued himself with this sort of mystique of the sea. Um, he also is a, a deep believer that there is a glorious destiny for him. And in his, uh, in his sort of detached in his maybe ability to rise above the everyday, the terrestrial in some ways, uh, in his ability to sort of rise above the everyday, he becomes a hero to Noboro Kurudo, uh, Kurudo, Kuruda, sorry, uh, who is a 13-year-old, a sort of alienated 13-year-old um, 
who he meets through his mother, Fusako Kuroda, um, with whom Ryuji begins a, uh, a love affair. Um, so there's a lot philosophically going on in this novel, and it's, it's somewhat difficult to break it all down, but... Um, Noboro is part of this group of other boys, um, somewhat intellectual, not particularly physically strong, but they're led by a charismatic character just called the Chief. Presumably he has a real name, but in this group he's just called the Chief. And Noboro is called number three. So each of the group members, apart from the chief, has a number. And they have this philosophy, this sort of almost Bushido-influenced warrior code. Again, it's very Nietzschean with this idea that, like, central to this philosophy is this idea that... Um, the world is fundamentally chaotic. The world is fundamentally deceptive. The world is fundamentally meaningless. And it's only they. They don't call themselves the Ubermensch, but the, it's only they, these supermen, these super 13-year-olds, um, who are capable of pulling back the veil of the impossible and achieving anything. They are responsible, as the chief says toward the end of the novel, for preserving the order of the world, for denying chaos the opportunity to destroy or to unhinge existence. Um, and this is an extremely militaristic philosophy um, which we actually find out pretty early on um, when Noboro is uh, reflecting uh, on on these dreams he's had he says he never cried not even in his dreams for hard-heartedness was a point of pride a large iron anchor withstanding the corrosion of the sea and scornful of the barnacles and oysters that harass the hulls of ships sinking polished and indifferent through heaps of broken glass, toothless combs, bottle caps, and prophylactics into the mud at harbor bottom. That was how he liked to imagine his heart. Someday he would have an anchor tattooed on his chest. So, these, these boys in this group, they're, one of their sort of core ethics is indifference to normal morality. Uh, they judge the world stridently by their own philosophical standards, and they strive to put those standards into practice as much as possible. And this hard-heartedness gets carried out in what, for me, is one of the most viscerally affected, affective scenes that I've ever encountered. Uh, actually, I read this novel for the first time a few years ago, and this is about the only scene that I that I really sort of vividly remembered from my first reading. Um, at one point, in order to transcend normal morality, to not even necessarily to transcend normal morality, because that implies that they're trying to prove a point, um, but to I don't know, to um, familiarize themselves with the experience of transcending normal morality. Um, I mean, it one line here, it says, at last the test of Noboro's cold, hard heart. So they find, th and this is pretty fucked up. So uh, if you're squeamish about cruelty to animals, as actually I am, as a cat owner, I've got my cat right there, actually. Um, you may want to stop 
at this point. Basically, they find a stray kitten, and they take it to a shed, and Noboro smashes it against a log twice until it dies. Um, at which point, the chief takes out a pair of scissors and essentially dissects this dead kitten. Um, he cuts open the throat, and they look at the the windpipe and the, the vocal cords and things like that, and cuts down through the chest, and they look at the, the internal organs of this cat, basically. They, they examine them in detail. And it's... I don't even like talking about it, actually, but... Um, as as horrific in a way as the scene is, it's a tremendous example of what's called the aesthetic of violence. Um, you think maybe about something like like the movie Fight Club, but the aesthetic of violence is this idea that you can describe horrific graphic violence and dissection, vivisection, whatever it is, all this kind of stuff. And you can do it in aesthetically effective ways. That you can you can make this in some way beautiful. Um, as as much as it's terrible. And that's one of Mishima's gifts as a writer, is he can do that. He can describe terrible violence in a way that's, that's artistically effective. Um, but this is the kind of thing that this group does. They have this philosophy that and it, it's I mean it's a psychopathic philosophy in some ways but again it's this idea that normal morality doesn't apply to them because they have some sort of higher destiny and indeed Ryuji is initially in that same sort of vein like he believes that he's destined to go to the sea he believes that he's destined for some sort of glory and it's only Later in the novel, after he returns to Yokohama, um, after he returns uh, to Fusako and Noboro, that he drifts from that. And that's really what... So, Noboro sort of keeps score on Ryuji about things he's done that are not philosophically or aesthetically acceptable to him. <clears throat> but it's really when Ryuji decides not to go back to sea, he decides to stay and basically become Noboro's father, which this, this group of boys considers to be the vilest thing in the world, um, fathers. And we actually get this uh, sort of renunciation of Ryuji's destiny, his 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 glorious fate, um, when he's uh, he uh, give me just a second. Um, uh, he and Fusaka, yeah, have gone out. Um, it's New Year's, and they've gone out into the park to watch the sunset, or watch the sunrise, sorry. Um, and he, he's reflecting on his decision to stay with her, and he, he says, um, are you going to give up that luminous freedom, that freedom of the sea and of destiny? And he says, and yet Ryuji had discovered on the return leg of his last voyage that he was tired. 
tired to death of the squalor and the boredom of a sailor's life. He was convinced that he had tasted it all, even the leaves, and he was glutted. What a fool he'd been. There was no glory to be found, not anywhere in the world. So, with this sort of renunciation, this, this essentially seals Ryuji's fate. Um, is at one point, uh, Noboro reflects, this man so at one with the Rakoyo's existence, that's the ship that uh, Ryuji had sailed on, so inseparably a part of the receding luster of a ship had sundered himself from that beautiful hole, willfully banished from his dream the phantoms of ships and the sea. So, because of this failure, because of this transition from the figure of the sailor who is forever departing in these, in these boys' imagination, and this decision to become a land dweller, and worse, to become a father, the boys decide that the only way Ryuji can um, can redeem himself, can, can sort of regain a kind of his former glory, is through death. And so they decide to lure him out into a, a secluded area, they decide to um, drug him with some tea, and they decide that they are going to murder him. Um, and as the chief says in an extremely unsettling speech, or part of an extremely unsettling speech, he says, we must have blood, human blood. If we don't get it, this empty world will go pale and shrivel up. We must drain that sailor's fresh lifeblood and transfuse it to the dying universe, the dying sky, the dying forests, and the drawn dying land. So again, they have these sort of cosmic ambitions, but they're also deeply alienated from society, from normal morality, etc., etc., so it's an extremely complex and really, really fascinating novel.